was wondering when you're going to get a mic. Sometimes it takes a while. Yeah. How's it going? Good. All right. Three after. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, let's see. Jumping right into it. Community time. Um, I think we have one person new on the call, but uh, for Mohan, for you, uh, it's a time when people who don't normally join the call are able to bring up topics that are not on the agenda that, that they think might be important to, to bring up. So does anybody have on the call, I'm sorry, does anybody on the call have a topic they want to bring up? All right, in that case, move forward. SDK stuff, um, nothing much here to say other than we do have a call right after this one. And the main topic for today's SDK call is Clemens uh, PR on the SDK document itself. Uh, so I expect obviously Clemens for you to be there, Scott, you to be there, and anybody else who's interested in the SDK stuff. So just a warning and reminder of it for people. Um, incubator, uh, the proposal doc or uh, slide deck is out there for people to take a look at. Um, I think for the most part, it is ready to go. Mark was wondering whether we needed a, you know, what is cloud events and status section to it. I did check with uh, Chris Anacek and he did suggest that we include that um, in case it's necessary. So I did include that as backup material. Um, I think for the most part, the deck is ready to go. What we're missing though, are the uh, list of uh, end users who are actually using cloud events. So I believe we only have one right now. So if you have customers that are using cloud events and they're willing to have their name mentioned publicly, please let me know because we can't go forward without that, without at least three uh, end users. And so we need at least two more. So get that to me offline if you have some people that you can mention. Yeah, Doug, I'm still working on that from, from Adobe. Yep, cool, thank you. And I know, uh, I think uh, Oracle might be working on it as well too. So hopefully we'll get, we'll meet that bar soon, hopefully. But anybody else, feel free to mention it. The more we have, I think the better it looks. So don't stop at three. Cool, thank you guys. Um, okay, nothing here to discuss for V1 other than the list is going down, but not as quickly as we'd like, because we did want to wrap this thing up within a matter of weeks, and that was already several weeks ago. So um, please, uh, be reviewing these PRs and stuff offline as best you can uh, so we can try to resolve them. Let's jump right into it though. Um, Christoph, are you on the call? I don't see Christoph, unfortunately. Okay, so this PR right here, he just wanted to do some clarifications around batching. And I believe the bulk of the change is this sentence right here. I want to make sure you guys are okay with that. It seemed pretty safe to me since it is just in the primer. Any questions or comments on this? I guess I say up here, this, this but up here is also new, um, but it seemed relatively minor. Any questions or comments on this? Looks good to me. Okay, anybody else? Okay, any objection to approving this? Excellent, cool, thank you guys. All right, um, Evan is not on the call. So, um, tell you what, let me pick on Clemens, because I think you've had some in input into this one. Yes. Uh, maybe you could talk to why this change is needed and the change itself. So we have, um, we have a problem in a few places um, with with maps in attributes. Um, specifically, when we're mapping to when we have the binary the binary modes where we explode the message onto transport frames, then we need to be able to go and take the the attributes and uh, map it into a transport header. Um, in HTTP, that's only a string. Um, and conceivably, you could use um, uh, JSON encoding there. Um, and that's something that everybody would feel comfortable because it's string and everybody's favorite encoding for text uh, is for, for such objects in JSON, uh, in, in text in JSON. Um, in MQP, it's getting a little weirder because um, in MQP, in the application properties where we map that to, it's, it's explicitly not allowed to use a map. Um, so you can only use normal types. The reason for that is, and this also brings us to the point why it's not so useful to have these, have complex types or so maps in there, is that in 
in AMQP lands, um, and we see this also in cases with um, uh, you know the new those new events uh, um, brokers, like what we have in EventGrid. Um, you have filter expressions of some sort, and these filter expressions go and and pick up the the metadata and allow you to go and compare them, etc., and have logical operations across them. Um, but it's really difficult if the context is if the 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 content is complex to go and navigate that content in those expressions. So usually that's not supported. So if we map a cloud event onto AMQP and we run this through a normal GMS broker, um, it's not going to be possible to, to poke into the, the complex data that sits in the metadata. It's just going to be unintelligible because there's no JSON parser in, in JMS. So, so it makes sense to constrain those fields for those reasons to, to simple types. Um, also, because um, it gets a little weird when you um, need to go and, and, and resort to an encoder like JSON um, for encoding that data um, in there. Um, so that's why we wanted to ex then exclude map from um, the uh, permissible types. And instead, if you, and this is, and we have, we have precedent for this, if you need multiple fields that are related for a particular purpose, you just make multiple fields. So our um, open tracing um, support that we have in the extension has um, trace parent and trace state as two separate fields, even though they are a structure. Um, and um, you see that in all the transport mappings, because HTTP doesn't support anything this complex, it's two headers that always to go together. Um, and you see that all in the, all the other transport mapping. So that's how that should happen. A map then re, re, is retained for the data attributes, and that's a wholly different discussion that we're having in a different in a different PR. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, I want to pick on Jim because I know you have, I think, strong opinions on this one. Where's where your mind at on this one, Jim? <laughs> so I understand the problem, uh, and I think I. I think I commented on this one. Um, I, I love the idea of keeping related items together. Uh, and, you know, I guess when I look at some of this stuff and then say, okay, what's this going to look like in a, in a structured JSON cloud event where stuff isn't being jammed into headers, um, it, it all started to get really messy and sort of somewhat unstructured to me um so that's why i think i was sort of proposing okay you know can we come up with a sort of slightly different angle where we allow for you know a very thin map so not maps of maps um maybe not maps of anything but more constrained um dictionaries so that we can use those constructs because it, it seemed to me uh, a little bit like um, the transport, the issues with transport bindings were sort of wagging the tail of the of the cloud event specification dog, um, and that's not you know necessarily a bad thing, but um, it it seemed a little bit extreme to sort of then do away with a lot of these sort of structural elements. Okay. Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, hi, this is uh, Vladimir. Um, I have one concern, you know, we have seen in various other uh, technologies where the space is flat. Uh, then uh, what people tend to do, they try to create uh, some namespaces artificially by using strings and maybe using dot or colon as a separator. And <clears throat> eventually that leads to fairly long strings. And uh, if I recall correctly, the maximum length for the uh, for the key is 20 characters. So soon we will run out of space and then people will start abbreviating and the readability will will decline. So that, that's my key concern. We've seen that in various other technologies and uh, would like to prevent that. Thanks. Yeah. Just just one more comment actually. Um, maybe I misinterpreted what, what Clemens was saying. I, the, the tracing extension we have um, Interestingly, if we have tracing in the tracing extension in the cloud event, we would also have the ICE, you know, the W3C headers in the HTTP 
headers as well. So we'd actually be duplicating stuff. Um, so it's not like the extension is going to um, remove the need for other stuff to be in the headers. So, I mean, you still need that namespacing of, you know, things that are defined in cloud events. We've, that's sort so, of a side issue on that one. So with, uh, that, yes, that's true that you would have both of them. Um, we actually made this a feature in the in the official W3C um, AMQP mapping. Since the since the uh, the message is um, I'm immutable, so you send an AMQP, you formulate an AMQP message, and the it sits in the application properties, sits the trace parent, trace state. Um, if you want to mutate that on the server. Um, that tra uh, the trace information, then you have to, in NQP, you made that explicit, you have to move it into a an, an, an message annotation. Here, we're already separating those things out. So effectively, the cloud event tracing information is end-to-end. -end. Um, and then on the HTTP path, you, you get the same tracing information. You might go and actually replicate this out. That's something that the, that the um, um, the binding, I don't know whether the binding actually specified an override for this or didn't, um, but it's, a, it's a effectively a feature to, al to allow preserving the original information um, from when the cloud event was published and then use it as an end-to-end -end tracing information and then use effectively for the HTTP flow um, a separate context. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I, I think as part of this sort of thought process, it suddenly struck me that maybe in that tracing extension, we need more guidance as to how SDKs are meant to handle this stuff. But I mean, that that's um, a completely different subject. To yeah, that's, that's a different maps. story. Yeah, yeah the, absolutely. The, um, so, so we've been toying around, I think, earlier with, um, you know, whether we could go and uh, this was when we still had the, the, the various extension bags. And, and we had this, we had a, we had two discussions about bags. Um, if I think Doug remembers those fondly. Um, and uh, there we were thinking about how we could go and, and, and resolve that for um, for headers, like how we can go and project those things into headers. The, if we allow, let's say we allowed a simple, a simple thing where you can have a map for an attribute and then, uh, but you could strain it such that you cannot have maps inside of maps, then you have a one level construct. Um, and then you could conceivably say, okay, so there's a mapping here where we go and, and say, we're going to take the name of the, the, the context attribute, and then we're going to take the name of the, the element that's inside of it, and we concatenate those in, in some way, and then that's how we map them to headers. Um, what, I find, what gets a little strange about this is if you are routing this through infrastructure, through, through intermediaries which have filtering capabilities, you now need to know those construction rules. Like you literally need to go and use them. You can't go in and take the event and then go in and key off fields. No, you actually have to go and say, oh no, that's the property dash this. You have to know how, you have to be keenly aware of exactly how the MPP mapping works. Yeah, that's that's Look, absolutely yeah. true. But you'd have to know that anyway, yeah, because you'd have to know that all the cloud event stuff gets prefixed with a CE in the first place. Yeah, so the, you're always going to have to have some knowledge of the way these things are mapped at the transport level. Yeah, I'm. I just I, I'm not sure it's worth the trouble. The 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 the. Um, and to back to the namespacing discussion, I think in the beginning of XML, because this is kind of this is a good good thing to look back into. In the beginning of XML, when the namespacing stuff came around, like what ninety eight, um, everybody was kind of in the belief that everybody would making these grammars, and then they would all be jammed together and collide in all these giant dictionary in all these giant documents, which would then consist of. So you would have one document that would consist of elements of 500 different schemas. And uh, in practice, that never happens or rarely ever happened. I mean, there, there are weird outlier cases, but, but typically you have documents which pick things from, you know, have a main schema and then they pick things from two or three other schemas with collisions being, collision risk being very low. And I think for events here, we're mostly dealing with 
with you know a main a, a main events which has then probably some application defined extension extensions um, and some of the standard extensions but I'm not sure that the collision risk is really that significant for events um, all the all the the experience from from you know XML soap and all that world suggests that the collision risk is not necessarily worth the trouble of having namespaces if i if i was doing all of that stuff again i would probably do away with namespaces altogether <laughs> so uh jim i got a question for you um if we were to have some constrained version of a map in there would you still want each individual property of the map to be serialized as an independent header in the http case or would you be okay with the entire map being serialized as one long string I, th I must admit, I thought our existing HTTP transport binding um, would map them into separate HTTP headers. It would. That's why I'm yeah. wondering whether, you want, whether you're asking to keep that or whether you'd be yeah. okay with it. No, no. I, I, and I guess that was my sort of uh, another angle to what I was sort of proposing was that it didn't actually change the transport binding specs. Right. Yeah, you know, they would still work exactly the same way as they do today, and it really becomes a um, a guidance or or, or an inf I don't know where you put enforcement to say, well, if you've got an extension, then you know what you can only have one level of of attributes or properties in that extension. Right. So, okay. So. I'm not quite sure. Do you have a use case for that? Um, well, I mean, you you have we have extensions today, like tracing has two attributes. Um, the tracing has two one. attributes, um, but they're mapped specially for HTTP. Even so, right? But they would but they would still travel as a, as CE extensions as well, yeah. And the sequencing one, they travel as CE more than one. Well, I thought they only traveled as the other headers. I would assume that the nope. SDKs don't care. They don't do anything special. They just say, oh, it's an extension, so the, I'll marshal it. The, the um, cloud, the C-sharp SDK actually handles them um, with an override. Like I have a facility to do the, over, the overriding. And then and they, they, don't pick, they, don't, they don't show up as a um, SCE because they're getting, there's an override. And they need they need to be mapped to specific HTTP headers for the uh, tracing, like yes. generic tracing mechanisms to work. Here we have that special I, mapping for those. Yes. Yeah, and I, and I think that was my original point. I sort of assumed that they would end up in two places. Yeah, in the in the W three C spec header, and um, a, a cloud event header. And I think that's what what Clemens was touching on earlier. That maybe they're carrying slightly different levels of information i don't think they do i think we only define one which one is it it's tracing yes it's tracing yeah so i think we uh, do just i think it just appears that i don't yes. think there are any ce dashes ce dash headers at all okay i would be concerned if there were ce dash headers because then what happens if they're different exactly yes well <laughs> so so there's a scenario here uh, that i just laid out like if it was the case that they were that there were um uh, duplicates then um, if you are running tracing through a proxy, so you, you're running effectively HTTP, you're running this through an HTTP proxy and the proxy is um, choosing to mutate this, yeah. then, then it can, but then the CE, the CE headers still give you a way to um, effectively have end-to-end -end tracing, which is blind to all the HTTP transport stuff. And you effectively, like at the point where you publish the event over HTTP, you're splitting up your context and you're giving one path, which is inclusive of all the HTTP stuff, and one path, which is purely end-to-end, -end, which doesn't care about the HTTP stuff at all. Um, but at the far end, you have a set of cloud events attributes. Yes. Um, which one is the tracing header on that cloud event attribute, if you've got both? Ah. Yeah, how you, how, which means how which are you going to which are you going to map back yes um, i th i think i think the end to end one is the one that you that you pick up um 
I think that's probably going to make your tracing sad because you'll have like these tails going off where the HTTP stuff happens mm -hmm. and then like nothing happens inside that trace, which, and you have to go back up to a different level to keep yeah. all the trace. Um, so I don't want to go too far off track here. And I know it's related, but I don't want to go too far off track. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a separate topic. I mean, if we look yes. at um, uh, sequencing, sequencing has um, two attributes. Yeah. And I know within paper, uh, we, we were looking at our own internal extension where we would carry potentially multiple contextual elements around as well. Yeah. Were you were you going to do filtering on that or just like description stuff? No, no, this is purely like end-to-end -end security and uh, tracing and our own internal so tracing. So you could still have a string that serializes a JSON object like a JOT does. As yeah, a yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think all we're so saying is, need to know about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all we're seeing is I think the same problem rearing its head here that we see today with our current transports. Yeah, and, and I think we were hoping that we could sort of be more transport agnostic. Um, I'm not explaining myself very well, but but to prevent all our all of our framework code from having to scurry around in um, in header properties of different transports to try and reconstitute um, contextual elements that we we were hoping we could use a sort of bounded collection of things to sort of hold those. But I, I may be arguing myself into a corner. No. But is there any reason that those have to be cloud event extensions as opposed to someplace in the data attribute? Uh, because I think we don't see them as things that the applications produce or are responsible for. Yeah, so the, the, the generation of the event is an application concern, but decorating it with um, contextual security or whatever is more of a framework concern in our world. Okay. Um, so it, you know, if the frameworks have to start scurrying around inside the business payloads, then we've, we've sort of tripped over a bit somewhere. Right. So I, I, I hate heading this path, but sometimes it's, yeah. it's the only option available. It seems to me that going forward without maps and then adding them later is doable, whereas starting out with maps, removing them later is a breaking change. Yes. And I'm wondering how bad it would be if we started off with no maps and then waited until people yelled at us. And that's perfectly fair. And I, yeah, you know, I'm very aware that I'm sort of a lone voice in the in the wind at the moment. So unless everyone else is silently agreeing with me, <laughs> which is always possible. You never know. We have a, we do have a quiet group sometimes. Um, I, and I and I don't want to to force the decision on this call because I do think it is a very big decision. And I, I suspect if Kathy were on, she actually would have a strong opinion on on your side as well, Jim. Oh, okay. Um, just so you know, I don't I don't think you're alone. Um, but I'm trying to figure out a way out of this because I, I don't want it to come down to just a formal vote. Um, I, I, that's the worst way to make a decision on this stuff. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not hearing any other, op, any other compromise proposals being put forward. So what if, so, so Jen, let me ask you this. If we were to go forward with out maps as of right now, um, do you think that by the time we go 1.0, because we are going to have a sort of a testing validation period, do you think by the end of that time, you'd be able to come back with a definitive, not happy, but I'm okay with it answer or a can't, can't live with it this way and here's why with a, with a concrete example of why your things fall apart kind of thing. I'm just wondering whether that would give you enough time to sort of make a stronger case one way or the other. Okay, let me put it this way. I, I, I don't want to hold this up because I mean, I, I think there's a lot of pressure to get stuff out. I know I would like somebody to sort of sketch out how, how extensions do work in this model. You know, how we manage, um, no, I don't want to use the word namespacing, how we protect the, um, the 
property names or the con you know the the attribute names for extensions um and you know just how that mechanism works if we're not properly encoding them and um protecting protecting them in some way how we stop extensions colliding so i think the answer to that is we don't and i think you have the exact same problem even if we do allow maps <clears throat> HTTP is a super, super complicated protocol, or sorry, well, not complicated, but it's, it's super widely used for all kinds of different, different scenarios. And there is no central registry. No, no, I, I, I get that. But I mean, we, at the moment, you've sort of created a safe space where I can, to a certain extent, extend without colliding. Um, although it's a bit ad hoc, granted, but there is a mechanism uh, and I just well, but, I'm not, but I'm not sure that's true though Jim right because I could create a a a property called Doug's and inside there I can create an uh, another property called ID and then it gets serialized as ce dash Doug's dash ID right and yeah. you think okay that's relatively unique but there's no one there's no stopping someone else from doing the exact same thing the other Doug on the call is an example right he could do the exact same thing and I would claim that the the odds of us colliding when we have maps is just as great as if we just said use prefixes because if i was to prefix this thing i would probably end up with the exact same thing as the http header i would still call it doug or ce dash doug dash id right but i mean if uh, maybe we're taking too much time with this but if two different extensions both had a thing called id yeah at least in the current model doug's is protected from paypal's yeah um, because they're they're contextualized yeah <laughs> Yeah, and that's really what I'm driving at. Yeah, I, contextualize I, I could have sworn we had text someplace, and maybe it's in the primer that says, when you come up with an extension, make it somewhat unique and, and, and descriptive so that you don't use something as generic as less ID. I think we have text like that someplace, but if not, we should definitely add that. Would that kind of thing help you in some way? You know, kind of implying you should namespace your, your extensions so that you try to avoid collisions? Yes. Okay. Okay, I, I, I can double check, but I could have sworn we had that text someplace, and I'll look for it while we have other discussions going forward. So, um, not to throw I don't know, this is an opposite of a wrench in here, um, <laughs> uh, I believe that we took hyphens or, uh, and underscores out of um, attribute names, attribute keys, because of this mapping in HTTP that made things ambiguous. Mm -hmm. So sure. we might be able to allow underscores and translate them to hyphens in attribute names now, which would give you a nice um, way to do like PayPal dash ID, for example, or PayPal underscore ID in your attribute and use PayPal as a prefix that hopefully other companies aren't using. True. I think, I think you're right. It makes it easier from a human readable perspective. But I think even if you didn't have any set or any special character as a separator, I think you'd still end up in pretty much the same boat. It's just not as readable. Um, you also don't have a natural delimiter character right now in attribute names, which is kind of frustrating. Exactly, right. If from a human readability perspective or even from a parsing perspective, if you want to parse them out in that way, I agree. But I think from a pure technical perspective, I think you're still in the same boat, even though I do agree with yeah. you. It'd be nice to add them back in, yes. Yeah, I'm worried about the humans here. Yeah, got it. Computer yeah. Skull, we'll yeah sort themselves out <laughs> yes humans. okay so tell you what why don't we i think we have a p potential way forward here let's take that offline and i'll take the action item to write up something to to try to come up with that compromise proposal that i think we're sort of dancing around and then we can review that during the week and possibly uh make a or try to resolve it next week does that sound fair okay yes. not hearing any complaints I do think we're, we're circling around something possibly good here. All right, Clemens, do you think you could summarize where you and James left things off in about five minutes? Clemens, on mute. Uh, yes, I was on mute because I need to get. Uh, you, you just called me as the church, who's uh, which is in the in the corner uh, of the block. Uh, has been starting to ring the bell, so I need to get an ice, insulate myself a little bit from that. Okay, so um, yes, so on our uh, what's that 470? 
yes. It, I think, what was the original issue of 456? Uh, just, yeah, something like that. Hold on. Um, 457. Well, the original, that was the original PR. Yeah, that was the original PR. 261 is the original one. He was complaining about the JSON and data. Yes, okay. So we discussed this one um, last time. Can you get the other five, um, 457? Can we take a look at that? Hold on, you're asking a lot of me. Just, yes, that. <laughs> I look at the text or the changes. Um, the conversation. Okay, which where let's say the long one. Uh, I forget where he has the midpoints. Okay, well let's let's I'll talk through it without looking at at anything in particular. Okay. Um, but go go to the original issue. Oh, the original issue. Yeah, this one. Okay. Okay, this one. So. We had a long, lengthy discussion about the the, the relationship of of maps and and um, and strings and binaries and data, etc. Um, and and James pointed out a few um, inconsistencies, and they they are they are caused mostly by the rules being too relaxed. Um, and he said, like, if I just go and have a a structure like this, and that's where we were last time where we we're discussing this. Like data foo equals true, like there's this is this is valid JSON, but you know um, it's not it doesn't fit into our type system because we don't have a boolean type to define. And then we pointed out in the last call where we discussed this, well, if you define uh, the the content data content type to be uh, JSON, then that is valid because we then know how to go and and decode this because there's a pointer in there. So we had some further discussions about this and they're fairly long and I encourage people to read up on, not this one, but the previous, the, the other one, five, uh, 657, and read through the discussion there um, on all the points. Uh, but where we, where we ended, where we landed was a, uh, a brief agreement that we formulated yesterday and that wasn't in the, in the, um, in the PR, but I'm gonna read that to you. If I find it, I sent that to you, Doug. Uh, and then out came the uh, the PR, but I just want to go and get the summarized um, out of our call. I'm trying to find it. Yeah, I have it. Okay. okay. So, um, so one thing we found in, in the course of this ent entire discussion is that if you use the binary mode and you haven't declared a data content type, then you don't know what to do with, uh, with, with data because then you need to stuff it into um, an MPP body or you need to stuff it into an HTTP entity body, but you don't have anything to declare it with because it is strongly recommended that you define a content type. And, and if you, the, the binary mode effectively has no event format. The entire event gets exploded out into the 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 the, uh, the the transport frame without any event format, so you don't have anything to go by. So if you use binary mode at all, then you must use a data content type because there's no other way. So you must pick one. Um, that now that causes the the effectively um, two paths, if you will. You have the the mode where you have structured events, which are you know all together, and it's one nice and neat package, where you don't need to go and, and declare the data content type because then you know it gets rendered with whatever the event format is natively, um, and you can also go and and you know you come out of an an in memory, let me call it info set, you render that into J into into JSON, you pick it up as JSON, you 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 suck it back into this in memory. Uh, info set, and then you can go and render this out as pro protobuf, pick it up again, and that event is going to be in, in itself consistent without needing any further information. Um, if you if you render it, if you use the binary mode uh, of any of the transports, then that's not so easy because you have a binary payload. That's why we call this thing binary, um, which is a which is presumably a um, an entity body which is worth doing this binary. Um, uh, um, rendering, which means it's presumably some format um, that is hard to express in this self-contained format. 
So, so that's the first constraint. If the binary mode, it, it, in the binary mode, it must be declared because otherwise there's no clean map mapping possible into a transport that requires that you declare the content type. Um, uh, and the default assumption then, if you were omitting, omitting it, the default assumption for that, for HTTP, for instance, where we would be um, application octet stream. So it would then kind of default to be binary. Um, if, um, if you if you have binary, so the binary mode of the transfer must it must use the declared data content type. If you have binary in the data attributes, right? So this is the binary mode. But if you have binary in the data or data attribute at all, then you must also declare the data content type, because then you need to effectively say to the receiver, just like you do with with HTTP and as you do with ANPP, what is in that what is in that um, 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 what is in that event? So you have to go and declare it. And if it's binary, then you also must, and that's already in our rules, use the data content encoding that says um, it's base64 if that is stored as a string and then therefore base64 encoded. Um, the data type of the data attribute, that's the next thing, must all of, also follow the rules of the content type. So you can't use the media type, you can't use a media type called, well, image JPEG, and then simply put a string into the, into the data element, that's illegal. And the way how you, how you learn about the required type for the data attribute is basically by looking at the, con by looking at the content, at the media type definition effectively. So if it's by default, you know, application octet stream that mandates that it's binary, and then you can go and effectively go into the catalog of, of the media types and determine whether it's a binary um, or whether it's a, whether it's a, a, um, it's text. But by default, it's effectively binary, and you encode it um, using a your default encoding or the def the encoding that's given to you uh, using the charts set parameter. Um, and then and then if you if you omit so this, so these are all rules effectively are for the relationship of, of binary and and data in the data attribute and how the data and the data attribute must effectively is kind of intertwined with the, with uh, the data content type in a very very similar way as that's the case for for um, HTTP. Um, what I wanted to preserve, and so so James' original suggestion was, and that's uh, what, what I was reacting to was to you know, make data make the the data uh, attributes completely um, um, typeless and what we would what we would lose is the ability to do this self contained event format because effectively it should be possible to have a, a data element that contains a map and that contains even a map of maps and effectively contains arbitrary complex content um, and you should be able to hold that in memory inside of you know the the SDK or whatever implementation you make of of cloud events, and have an implementation that then implements the type system that we have defined. So it has an, a notion of an integer and has an inter, has a notion of a date. And if you look at the SDKs that we have today, we're having we're having those we're having those types effectively as they um, are um, you know idiosyncratic for the respective platforms and runtimes. And so we're having these in memory in memory representations, and then we just render them out using the rules that we have into the respective encodings. In JSON, lots of it ends up as string. In NQP or in um, in Avro, lots of it um, ends up as effectively the direct mapping of the types. Um, and if you then lift it up again into a um, an in memory um, representation you end up again with effectively the data element being a, a dictionary, um, including uh, dictionaries of di dictionaries. So that works. So today with the rules that we have, it's possible to carry structured data and set uh, structured data and set the data attributes and just have that natively encoded with whatever the event format is, which also then yields transcoding. If we wouldn't allow map, then and we, if we force to have a data content type at all times, we would lose that ability completely. Um, if we would say you must use the data content type and you must set it to, let's say, application JSON, that's fine if you have it 
if, if the outer event format is JSON, but then if you send it to someone and that, that next party wants to go and route that event over um, a different transport and wants to use a binary encoding like Avro, with that declaration of the data content type application JSON, you're now forcing that renderer effectively to go and encode the content as JSON um, and carry it as a string inside of an otherwise more efficient binary encoding because that's what the rule is. So by emitting this, you're effectively giving the, uh, the implementation, the, the, the intermediary, the flexibility to go and encode it as whatever the, the outer event format is. And that's what I want to preserve. That works today. Um, and I didn't want to go and destroy that, um, uh, even though we needed to strengthen up the rules um, around binary. Now, in terms of the concrete proposal that James made, um, I have uh, provided, and that was something that he sent to, he, he wrote today and he was saying, we, we talked this week and he was saying, I'll probably do this by the end of the week or beginning of the week. And then Doug basically pressed him this morning, like my time to, to write something up. So he probably wrote that a little bit in a hurry. I'm not sure. Um, I wrote, so there's James' proposal. I wrote um, a, a bit different formal text, which is, is effectively turning the definitions that he wrote on his head and make this into must rules for the binary. Um, and so that's mostly just a matter of negotiation. I think in terms of the rule set that we want to define, we're, we're pretty close together. Um, but we are, we just need to get the language, the language sorted out. So that's in four, what is that, 470 is um, is that proposal. So I would encourage you to go and, and take a look at um, 470 and um, and see whether the rules work for you. Um, I have a question. How does this proposal handle Booleans in the JSON payload? Um, you can use, so if if you declare, if you can only use Booleans, you can only use the, the JSON Boolean Boolean type. If you explicitly declare boolean, if you explicitly ex declare JSON, um, but at that point it's binary from the point of view of the protocol. It's it's as long as you're sticking to JSON, it's it stays in. So as long as the outer event format, event envelope is JSON, then uh -huh. the rule is then the rule is that you that any JSON, any valid JSON is allowed inside the data attribute. What is the type of the data attribute at that point? The type of the data attribute at that point is um, a, it's a map or, well. Maps okay. can't contain Booleans, right? Oh, sorry. If, so, so the, 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 um, the JSON. Or arrays. Yeah, yeah, the JSON encoding effectively has an escape hatch for this. The, the um, let's go and take a look at this. Um, effectively, there's no, there's a type, so there's a type for. Um, Does this mean we have three cases for data? What do you mean? We have explicitly declared as JSON, we have yes. binary, and then we have, if you didn't do one of those two. Yeah, we have the, we have the native, native can transcode. And we have the, the, you can stuff everything JSON in there. You can stuff anything JSON in there. And the, you can stuff anything JSON in there case is, one, is the one that's for me more, on more shaky ground than, than, than the other cases. Yeah, but we have three cases, right? Because we've got yes. binary, we've yeah, we got do. treat it like a cloud event type system, and we've got, no, this is actually JSON. Yeah. Might be good to spell out that there are three choices. Um, that's true. So I, what I don't want to do okay, at this time, it, what, I, what I don't want to do is eat up the last, the last 13 minutes on this because it is still yes. fresh, but I did want to bring it up to people's attention. So thank you, Clemens, for summarizing it, but I, I, I really want to move on. And I, okay. Evan, I think you're bringing up some great points. Can you put that into the PR itself? And that way Clemens and James can go back and forth and try to address that. Okay. But, I, but, but unless there's, but I, like I guess I'd like to move on only because I just, I just I wanted to bring this up to people's attention to take a look at it and see how it's progressing because this obviously is a very big issue we need to resolve relatively quickly. Yeah. But it's not ready for voting, so I don't want to spend time on it when we do have other things that are, are ready to go. That's okay with people. But thank you, Clemens, very much for summarizing. Okay. Cool. Thank you.
All right. Eric, has anything changed since the last time we talked about this PR? I had to rebase it, but nothing else. Yeah. Okay. You want to just quickly give like a one sentence overview to refresh people's memory about what this one's about? Sure. Uh, one of the questions I had when I started joining the calls was uh, whether persistence would be something that was addressed. Uh, I'm particularly interested in event sourcing and that's why. But um, uh, after discussions, uh, it seemed like it would make the, uh, spec, the spec more br uh, brittle and um, that it would bring up some very hard challenges that I don't think are solvable. And so uh, this says, we're not dealing with the uh, issues of persistence, that is, you know, writing the entire event down and making sure that it's secure and uh, that we know who uh, originally wrote the event, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that those, all those, the, although those mo might be uh, handled by extensions, you're on your own. Do something smart. Right. Okay, and just to make a note, this is, uh, just in the primer itself, it's not normative. This is just explaining why we chose not to touch the problem. Any questions or comments on this? All right, not hearing any, any objection to approving? All right, cool. And I apologize, it took us a while to get back to this one. Thank you. No problem at all. All right, that's weird. Okay, I'll fix that. Um, Fabio's not on the call. However, I believe the last time we looked at the um, Avro transport, for the most part, we were okay with it, other than Jim. You are still on the call, right? Jim, you said you wanted a little more time to look it over. Did you get a chance to look it over, and are you okay now? I, I think, actually, uh, and a, what Clemens referenced was, was um, what I was sort of thinking of uh, in that, <laughs> Uh, my original concern had been the difference between the way the Avro one had been pr put together versus the way Protobuf had been done. Um, but I think the proposal as it stands now is more extensible and um, generic. So I, I think I think my original concern has been addressed. Uh, so I have, um, did this change recently? No, I don't think so. Ah, well, yeah. so yeah, my comment is based on if, if the changes were adopted, yeah. Um, yeah, I, so, so if you take a look at the comments, because I looked at this this week, um, and, um, and if you, if this requires a bit of knowledge of Avro. Um, oh, there you go, you're right. Ah, okay, so, so great. So with, if, we, if we do this, then, um, and, well, this was not very clever of me. That was very Googling the right thing of me. But, you know, um, sometimes stack, stack Overflow and other things are just helpful. Um, and so that schema now, that if, we, if we modify this, the PR accordingly and, and adopt this uh, schema, then that will work. Effectively, this turns um, the, the, the Avro encoding into a map that understands all of our types. And then that becomes effectively the same. <laughs> apparently, apparently, now that I'm looking at it, this supports batches and this supports um, all the types that we need effectively. Yeah, I think this just works now. It's very much like the Proto model. Yeah. Do we need float in there? Uh, no, we don't. Good catch. Or Boolean. I'll comment on those two. Okay, great. If we remove Boolean and float, does that address everybody else's concerns? Yeah. So let me ask this question. Do people approve of this PR modulo removing float and Boolean? Uh, I think everyone also supports binary. I think we need to have that too. It sounds like we need more talking. Yeah. yeah I, 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 think, I think what I mean, I, what I did is I literally took I found a, a post in some forum somewhere and literally just took that, that text, copied that down without thinking. So, um, so maybe he, maybe probably took my proposal a little bit more seriously than I thought he would. <laughs> Shame on him. <laughs> okay, well, when that comes out right now, why don't you guys comment on the PR itself and maybe we'll get a result next week. But we, okay. it sounds like it needs a little more tweaking. Yeah. Okay, all right. Moving forward then, 
Orlando will not be here for long. Talk about air handling. This one was mine. I just added a tiny little section here. I think that I think I actually got some LGTMs on this one. Just want to make sure you guys are okay with it. Give you a second to read this. I think that's suitably hand wavy enough. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Goal achieved. Okay, and it, it is just in the primer. Um, any questions, concerns about this? This leaves the SDK authors in a rough spot. Does it? How? What do I do with air handling? Well, the spec itself isn't going to say that, right? If you're looking for air handling statements, if anything, that might go in the HTTP binding spec, right? So, I think Scott's question might be, um, if I receive a cloud event and the um, time, you know, the, the time field is not formatted correctly, do I toss the cloud event? Do I omit that field and pass the rest along? Do I um, ignite the computer on fire so that no, the evidence is destroyed? <laughs> we don't talk about error processing. Because uh, I've been doing the light the computer on fire thing and it's getting expensive. Google has plenty of money. I don't understand the concern. Well, so, so the, directly, like what I'm asking about is I still have no idea how to implement batch. And this, this statement doesn't help me understand how to implement batch. So I think there are two different questions being raised there. One is in general, you just get a cloud event and there's an error in there, what do you do? I would claim that the normal HTTP spec tells you what to do there, right? You got some bad input from the user, meaning the client, and you're supposed to return some variant of a 400. Now, I think I'm Scott's question is harder. I'm, I'm talking about every transport. I'm not sure I'm following, because wouldn't most transports say what to happen if there's bad input? Or if they don't, is that really our problem to solve? Because they obviously don't solve it themselves. Scott? I, I, I feel like you're, the spec is saying we are uh, defining the transport and yet we are def only defining the happy path. And no, you, no, no. We, we, don't, we don't define the transport. <clears throat> we just define how a cloud event looks on the transport. Y yeah, and, but we also define a little bit of processing. And Do so we? we define like response codes and things like that for, for certain things and when sh things should knack and act. But we don't really help more advanced processing. So do you have a proposal for how to solve your concern? No, no, I just have a concern. Because <laughs> I, I definitely understand your concern relative to batching. I think that actually might be something we may want to talk more about. But in general, I didn't think we got into processing model stuff, to be honest. We just say, this is how it looks over HTTP. And HTTP tells you or doesn't tell you how to handle errors. What other people think? But we add extra semantics on top of HTTP. So if it's valid HTTP but not valid cloud events, should we say something about what to do there? I, I Maybe in the transport binding, but it seems like we might want to have some text at least so different libraries behave the same. So at one point in time, I can't remember who it was, but somebody opened up a PR to almost do that. They basically wanted to duplicate what the HTTP spec said relative to HTTP error codes or, or response codes. And the I, I think it may have even been Clemens who came back and said, basically, why are we, why are we repeating what's in HTTP? That was me. So, I'm okay deferring this. I think I'm looking for something slightly different, but maybe this is not what this part is supposed to do. What I'm wondering is if I receive a cloud event and some part of it is malformed, um, should there be some guidance on whether that whole thing is not a cloud event or whether I should keep going the best I can? 
What other people think? Well, the the um, the webhook specification, which is uh, so our HTTP binding only defines how to map the the cloud event onto an HTTP message, either direction, because they don't share, they don't differ except for the either having a request line or a status line, um, and then some some uh, you know connection headers like stuff RFC seventy two thirty stuff. Um, but for cloud events, they're they're effectively the same. That's what that spec does. And then the webhook spec is is how we bind that to the transport, and that is probably that that has error codes. And it says, you know, you can't you can't use this, and you can't use this, and you must you must use this. So like, two hundred okay, or two hundred one created, or two hundred four no content, and four twenty nine too many requests, and four four fifteen like we specify that for for in the webhook spec. Um, for various for various um, um, scenarios, and if you submit a malformed cloud uh, um, uh, request, um, or sorry, a malformed cloud event, I would expect you to throw a four hundred. So it's like it's, it's but it's specific. That is specific to that is really specific to um, to uh, to HTTP, right? HTTP has a set of rules around this, and then there's other pro other protocols which have different rules about this. If you have a an an MQP path where the broker is cloud events aware, it would go and and reject the message. That's just a different it's a different mechanism, but it would use it would use the MQP error codes and uh, and reject the message for you. So, Clemens, to that point, um, maybe what Scott maybe I can channel Scott a bit. I should there be a separate document that describes that AMQP behavior or would that be in the AMQP transport specification? Um, well, my principle is to not repeat what's in other specs if we point to those specs and you can read them. And if we, so at least not, not the normative parts because those specs might evolve and may have further error codes they might change your opinion on, on certain things and you want to stay up up to date you don't want to you don't want to start binding yourself to a particular you know you, you want to stay flexible in in you know having a binding that when works with http 1.1 and works with http 2 and works with http 3 without you necessarily having to track all those things um, so that's why i'm so that's why i'm trying to not to not to you know import too many rules from other specs into into um, uh, this spec um, but the primer, the primer and the implementation guide could certainly do that. So we're taking that out of time. I think we're going to have to stop here. Let's not approve this one yet since we may want to tweak it. That's fine. Um, quick question. Is, has, has anybody had any concern with this adapter document for how to, how to convert well, some well-known events into uh, cloud events? I was hoping to get this one approved today to get in there so people could start actually implementing it. Because I think I actually had some LGTMs in there. Is there any objection to approving this one the last second or do people want more time? Any objection? I guess I'm trying to figure out, um, I maybe mean, this seems like a useful thing to do. Are these intended to be definitive or exemplar? Uh, technically, everything's exemplar. Um, okay. However, if it's exemplar, been, it's totally fine. Well, yeah, well, however, I have been working with GitHub and GitLab guys to make sure that they, if they implement, if they support this themselves, this is how they would do it. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. then that's great. Yeah. That seems like it's more definitive than exemplar. It, a little bit. I just can come right out and say it. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Okay. If you're working with the producers, the people who'd originally produced those events, then that seems like it's definitive yeah and these are yeah these are i believe non-normative specifications so they are from that from a legalistic perspective they're exemplars but they're because they're non-normative okay any objection to approving that one okay i apologize we're slightly over time but i wanted to see if we can get to some of the older stuff thank you okay with that everybody can go except for the sdk guys i'm looking at specifically clemens uh scott um, who else is on the call still? Oh, James, you're actually there. Hey, James. Um, 
Who else? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have this meeting in my calendar. I saw the SDK one and thought that that was this one. So. Ah, okay. Well, I'll do the roll call anyway, so you can actually get credit for it. Uh, who else does SDK work? Anyway, if you're on the SDK stuff, please stick around. We've got, we've got to talk. Klaus, that's what I was looking for, Klaus. Okay, everybody else is free to go. Thank you, guys. Um, oh, or Claudio? No, okay. I'll, I'll give them credit. I forgot to ask. I apologize. And James Rupert. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks. By the way, one of the